Welcome. My name is Rosie McDowell, and I chair the Center for Social Concerns Justice Education Team. It is to call together our staff annually to select and um, implement a Catholic team for the year. And on behalf of the team and Father Paul Coleman, our executive director, I welcome you to our first event um, of this academic year. Um, and I welcome you very warmly to Gettys Hall. The Catholic social teaching tr um, theme for this academic year is Pacem and Terrace, Raising Voices. Selected on the 50th anniversary of the publication um, by John, Pope John Paul XX, excuse me, Pope John XXIII, this encyclical, Pacem and Terrace, Peace on Earth, promotes the formation of right and respectful relationships among individuals, societies, and nations. It also urges active participation in civil society, society according to in individual talents, gifts, and vocations. The vision of this encyclical is expansive, and I quote, we are called to establish with truth, justice, charity, and liberty, new methods of relationships in human society. In selecting this theme, we, th we seek in our own way to promote the teachings found within the encyclical, to encourage active civic participation, while beginning a discussion on civil dialogue, especially on the difficult topics that often divide people into opposing ideological camps. We have seen recent examples of this on our own campus, across our country, and indeed throughout the world. Tonight's panel discussion will introduce Pacham and Terrace and its historical and current relevance and challenge us as a faith community to consider what voices are heard in our society, how we raise our own voices, and how we undertake action to promote the common good. Before we begin, I invite John Schomer, a member of our Student Advisory Council at the Center for Social Concerns, to offer an opening prayer. Let us take a moment to quiet ourselves and open our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, who are called the Prince of Peace, who are yourself our peace and reconciliation, who so often said, peace to you, grant us peace. Make all men and women witnesses of truth, justice, and brotherly love Banish from our hearts whatever might endanger peace. Enlighten our rulers that they may guarantee and defend the great gift of peace. May all peoples of the earth become as brothers and sisters. May longed for peace blossom forth and reign always over us all. You live and reign with the Father and Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very, very much, John. That prayer was from actually John the 23rd himself, a poem, a prayer that he himself composed. And thank you very much to Rosie and the Justice Ed Committee for organizing um, this panel. Also, in advance, I'd like to thank our panelists. Moderating our discussion tonight will be a friend of mine, Notre Dame's Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, Professor John McGreevy, IA O'Shaughnessy, Dean of the College. Dean McGreevy is a Notre Dame graduate, I think class of 1986, and he's been teaching here um, probably for about 15 years, 15th year. He teaches courses in American political and religious history and is researching these days the intersection of religion and politics in the U.S. since the 1960s, as well as 19th century Jesuit activity in this country and elsewhere. He is the author of several distinguished monographs, award-winning books, actually, and indeed, um, I would think they almost are uh, field-defining works these days in American Catholic history. His first book, Parish Boundaries, the a Catholic Encounter with Race in the 20th Century Urban North, won the Shea Prize for Best Book in, Amer in Catholic History. 
And his later work, Catholicism and American Freedom, a History, examines tensions between traditional American notions of liberty and progress and Catholicism, and was praised in the New York Times and Washington Post in very affirming book reviews as brilliant and a masterpiece. As a colleague and friend, and now someone who works as a professor with John and under his direction in the college, I say to you with great confidence that this is a distinguished person. We're really grateful he's here. And please join me in welcoming him to his role as our moderator. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Father Coleman, for that introduction. And thank you uh, for the prayer at the beginning of our proceedings. It's very rare, actually, that one of the faculty in the College of Arts and Letters says that they work under me. So I'm in a very good mood <laughs> uh, already. We should have a, a, a lively panel this evening. Our three panelists are on my immediate right, uh, Margie File, who holds a joint appointment in the Theology Department and the Center for Social Concerns. She is a faculty fellow at the, of the Kroc Institute. Uh, and her research interests include Catholic social thought, racial justice, ecological ethics, ecumenical dialogue, and peace studies. With Tobias Winwright, she recently co-edited Violence, Transformation in the Sacred, They Shall Be Children with God. And with Gerald Schaubach, if I have that right, she is co-editor of Sharing Peace, Mennonites and Catholics in Conversation. More recently, she is the co-author of The Scandal of White Complicity in U.S. Hyper-Incarceration, a Nonviolent Spirituality of White Resistance to be published next year. Professor File is a co-founder and resident of the St. Peter Claver Catholic Worker Community in South Bend, Indiana. So please join me in welcoming Professor File. <laughs> On her right is John Duffy, an associate professor of English and the Francis O'Malley Director of the University Writing Program. He is an expert in how rhetoric shapes people's identity and position in the world. And his more particular specialty is the historical development of literacy and rhetoric in cross-cultural contexts. Context. His research includes rhetoric used to describe autism, immigrants, women, urban children, and others on the margin of civic life. He is the author of the award-winning book, Writing from These Roots, The Historical Development of Literacy in a Hmong American Community, which traces the development of literacy in a Midwestern American community of Laotian Hmong immigrants who came to the United States as refugees from the Vietnam War. He is also the co-editor of Toward a Rhetoric of Everyday Life. And on John's right is Daniel Philpot, who's an Associate Professor of Political Science and Peace Studies uh, here, here at Notre Dame. He researches how societies address past injustices seeking to balance truth, justice, reconciliation, and equality. He's a Senior Associate at the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, and as part of that work, unusually uh, for a humanities scholar, he travels regularly to Kashmir and other places where he trains leaders in faith-based diplomacy. His most recent book, published by Oxford University Press, is titled Just and Unjust Wars, An Ethic of Political Reconciliation, which offers a fresh approach to the age-old problem of restoring justice in the aftermath of widespread injustice. Reflecting his interest in political theory and ethics and international relations, he has also written on the morality of self-determination and on religious freedom as an end to American foreign policy. He has won a number of prestigious fellowships and has published articles in world politics, ethics, political studies, the Journal of International Affairs, and the National Interest. I believe I just I forgot to have us give a little applause to John Duffy. So please applaud John <laughs> Duffy and Daniel. <laughs> our procedure this evening is as follows. Each of our speakers will speak for no more than 15 minutes. And I'm going to give them a warning tug on the shoulder as they get near 15 minutes. Uh, and then we should have plenty of time for a question and answer. And I hope that you'll be formulating your questions and get your hands up quickly uh, when our panelists finish and, and we'll get into a lively question and answer. So to begin, Margie. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming tonight. Um, my assignment was to um, say a bit about the historical and contemporary relevance of the document Pachamenteris. So as Rosie mentioned, Pachamenteris was an encyclical letter issued by Pope and now blessed Pope John XXIII, uh, released on the 11th of April, 1963. And he died shortly after that, on June 3rd. So this is significant. He, he was dying of cancer. He knew his days were numbered. And this is what he had to say about peace. 
Uh, some of the background context, among other things, the Berlin Wall went up in March of 1962. And the Cold War was in a very hot phase uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis of October of 1962. John XXIII served as an intermediary in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, conveying, helping to convey a message of peace and uh, speaking indirectly with both Khrushchev and the Kennedy administration. And I think that that action is a very good example of his vision of peace in a number of ways. Uh, first, in this situation, he gave primary importance to the dignity of each person involved rather than to the ideological issues at stake. So he was able to wing Khrushchev's trust and I would even say friendship of a, sorts, of a sort uh, because Khrushchev knew that he respected uh, the dignity of each person. Khrushchev knew that uh, John the 23rd had in mind and heart the dignity of each of the Soviet citizens and all the citizens of the world, in fact. Uh, he had a deep awareness and appreciation of the specter of nuclear war, and he wrote about that in this document. Secondly, in this situation, he acted from a strong sense of hope. Uh, hope is a theological virtue, not a utopian sense of um, wishing for a better reality, but a very concrete sense of hope rooted in uh, charity, rooted in love, and rooted in God's love uh, as helping to shape a vision of peace for the world. And that comes through in the rest of the document. And thirdly, in this situation, he worked for peace uh, out of faith and prayer. So in, in paragraph 165 of this document, he writes, quote, in fact, there can be no peace between men. And um, I'm going to just make some gender appropriate changes for our times as I read this. So in fact, there can be no peace between human beings unless there is peace within each one of them, unquote. Following the way of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, inner peace will take root in, quote, an order founded on truth, built according to justice, vivified and integrated by charity, and put into practice in freedom, unquote. Another part of the context was the fact that Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, had just opened uh, in the fall of 1962. And in his remarks for the convocation, John the 23rd clearly linked his hopes for the council to the desire for peace. Among other things, he called the church to be the church of the poor. While Pachamenteris was not a document of the council, it was an encyclical letter issued by the Pope, it did help to give shape to a vision that significantly informed the council proceedings and documents, and particularly Dignitatus Humanae, the, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, and Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. So when Pachamenteris lays out this vision of peace, it begins with a moral order organized around truth, justice, charity, and freedom. Uh, in 1961, John XXIII had issued another encyclical called Mater et Magistra, in which he used truth, justice, and charity as the organizing principles. Here he adds freedom. And this is significant because in Dignitatus Humanae, uh, issued in 1965, the, the bishops of the world will embrace religious freedom. And this is a great example of development of doctrine in the Catholic tradition. Um, not long before, in the late 19th century, religious freedom was, was condemned. Um, by one of John XXIII's predecessors. So this is a relatively short time in the history of the church, and we see this significant development. It's a sign of the times. And this is part of what enables uh, John XXIII to use human rights language in this document. So he points to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights issued in 1948 in very positive terms. But he lays forth in this, in this document a Catholic vision of human rights. What's distinctive about this vision is that rights are always correlated with duties. So it's not possible to speak about a personal right to a, a given um, practice or possession 
like a right to education or a right to housing without at the same time recognizing that I have an obligation to work for the realization of that right on the part of every other person in society. Another important aspect of this vision of the correlation of rights and duties is that rights are rooted in human dignity and ultimately Dignity is rooted in the creation of each person in the image of God, creation imago dei. So there's a very strong theological uh, foundation for this vision of rights and duties in this document. And another distinctive feature is that he's not just talking about civil and political rights in this document, but socioeconomic rights as well. And so following this document, you see a flurry of human rights activity um, on the part of Catholics all around the world. Uh, so I, tomorrow is September 11th. Now most people associate that date with um, uh, the attacks in New York and Washington. Uh, I w lived in Chile under Pinochet with the Holy Cross Associates, so I always associate September 11th with, with the coup in Chile. And one of the, one of the um, significant developments in the aftermath of the coup was the fact that the Catholic Church, the Archdiocese of Santiago, immediately began work on human rights and set up the uh, Vicariate of Solidarity, where later on in the 80s I worked to um, document human rights abuses um, uh, on behalf of the families of the detained and disappeared. So this is an example of the sort of human rights work that was spurred and, and encouraged by Pachamenteras. Another distinctive feature of this vision of the correlation of rights and duties is that this is part of the framework of truth, justice, charity, and freedom directed toward what end? Toward the common good. And this document is distinctive because it also puts forth a vision of the universal common good. So how do we think about the good as peoples, as humanity together in the world? I would say that this question today is even more urgent to ask what the universal common good might mean in the face of ecological crisis. Another feature of this vision is uh, the emphasis on respect for individual conscience uh, in working toward the common good. So this would pave the way for a very strong account of conscience in Gaudium et Spes 79. Um, and this is significant because this uh, is part of what enables, for instance, the U.S. bishops to write about conscientious <coughs> objection in the face of the Vietnam War. Uh, solidarity features prominently in this document, uh, and I would say that this is an important foreshadowing of what John Paul II will do in his encyclical in 1987 in Solicitudo Socialis, because John the 23rd talks about solidarity as linking charity and the common good. And in Solicitudo, John Paul II will talk about solidarity in terms of love for the neighbor that extends beyond shallow distress at the misfortune of another, but instead, um, but instead helps realize this vision that we are all really responsible for all. It calls us to love for the other person, even to the point of giving our own lives on behalf of another. Um, that's this very thick vision of the common good uh, that I think John Paul, John Paul II was able to articulate because John the 23rd has, had emphasized this in Pachamenteras. He also advocated uh, nuclear disarmament and critiqued the deterrence theory of mutual assured destruction uh, in the arms race. He said, one of the signs of the times is in this age of atomic energy, it is contrary to reason to hold that war is now a suitable way to restore rights which have been violated. So 1963, we can ask what that might mean for our own day. War is not a suitable way to restore rights which have been violated. And there, there would be many other smaller points to mention, but just as part of fleshing out this vision of the good, 
Um, he also put forth uh, hope for effective public authority on a global scale. So the UN, for example, uh, some have said that this is an example of John XXIII's utopian approach, but his successors have all continued to emphasize the same hope that the UN or some other entity could ex exercise effective public authority on a global scale. Caritas and Veritate 67, for example, puts that forth. I don't think anybody would accuse Benedict XVI of being utopian. Um, I'll move ahead to the contemporary significance of, of the document because I don't want to get tapped on the shoulder yet. Three minutes? Okay. So in the post-Cold War and post-9-11 era, marked by political and religious pluralism and a fragile nation-state system, John XXIII's appeal to peace through the lens of the dignity of each person and their correlative rights and duties offers promising common ground for dialogue across very different cultural conceptions of the good. And I have three points here. First, key to his approach is the question of participation in public discourse. Following his lead, we might ask, whose voices are heard in the, in the political discourse of our daily lives? Whose interests are at stake in a given issue? And are those persons being fully heard? Are they able to exercise the right and duty of participation in shaping the common good? These questions could be used for discernment as we consider what the moral order of truth, justice, charity, and freedom would entail in our own time. Secondly, at several points, Pachamanteris addresses the law of fear or the grip of fear. And in each case, the antidote put forth is trust and love rooted in faith. Be between human beings and among peoples, quote, it is not fear which should reign, but love. A love which tends to express itself in a collaboration that is loyal manifold in form and productive of many benefits." Unquote. Something to consider in our own times as we mark September 11th tomorrow. What, what would it look like for love to reign instead of fear? And finally, this text was issued on Holy Thursday, and John the 23rd calls attention to the words of the liturgy, noting that Jesus' peace entails passion and death that leads to resurrection. Quote, he leaves us peace, he brings us peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. This is the peace which we implore of him with the ardent yearning of our prayer. May he banish from the hearts of all whatever might endanger peace. May he transform them into witnesses of truth, justice, and brotherly and sisterly love. May he enlighten the rulers of peoples so that in addition to their solicitude for the pro proper welfare of their citizens, they may guarantee and defend the great gift of peace. May he enkindle the wills of all so that they may be overcome the barriers that divide, cherish the bonds of mutual charity, understand others, and pardon those who have done them wrong. By virtue of his action, may all peoples of the earth become as brothers and sisters and may the most longed for peace blossom forth and reign always among them." Unquote. Fifty years later, the liturgy itself may be a context in which Catholics experience a need for respectful dialogue. Pachamanteris did not prescribe particular solutions to contentious issues. Rather, it suggested an ethos shaped by truth, justice, charity, and freedom to be lived out in the application through mutual trust, respect, and collaboration toward the end of the common good. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Uh, good evening. I want to say uh, thank you uh, to Rosie McDowell and to uh, Father Coleman for inviting me to participate in this panel uh, and to um, <clears throat> share my thoughts with you. I feel very privileged to have the opportunity. Uh, for my part of the panel, I'm going to talk about the about Pacham, <clears throat> about the encyclical, the raising our voices part. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we raise our voices, the way that we do that. And specifically, I'm going to talk about um, 
public discourse, which most people think is in a very bad way, and which most people also feel that there is nothing or very little that we can do about that. So in examining that common understanding, I want to raise three questions tonight. The first question is, are things, is our public discourse really as bad as it seems? And the answer that I will give you is, yes it is, it's worse than it seems. <laughs> it's a crisis. I'm going to argue that we, ha we are in a crisis of public discourse. Now that's kind of depressing, so let me go on to the next question. The next question is, and this is for the historically minded, hasn't it always been this way? Hasn't American discourse always contained a strain of poison? And, the, and, and aren't we really just experiencing the same wine in a new bottle? And the answer to that that I will say is yes and no. Yes, it always has been this bad, but no, it hasn't had the same effect, and that's because the bottle has changed. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then the third question is, given the first two very depressing answers, I'll try to be a little more positive on the third answer, is, is there anything that we can do about this? Is there any way that we can build toward a better public discourse? And the answer that I want to give to that question is yes, we certainly can. And that arguably, Notre Dame is the ideal place to begin that reconstruction of public discourse. And I'll try to explain why I believe that to be the case. So um, let me start with the first question, which was, is our discourse really as bad as it seems? And to kind of introduce that, I, I wanted to share with you, uh, I wanted to recall a recent moment in, our, uh, in American public discourse, one that was quickly forgotten. Uh, not, not Rush Limbaugh and Sandra Fluke, but more of a sort of everyday type of thing. It took place on a Facebook page, uh, ironically titled the New York 19 U.S. House of Representatives Civil Discussion Center. And the context of this was a congressional race in Upper New York, uh, District 19, and a Facebook conversation about legislation to offer equal pay to women. The conversation was taking place when someone named Jay Townsend joined the conversation. He was a campaign spokesperson for Nan Hayworth, the Republican candidate. And in the course of this discussion, he wrote the following. My question today, he was talking, responding to a, a constituent who identified himself as Tom. He said, my question today is when is Tommy Boy going to weigh in on all the Lily Ledbetter hypocrites who claim to be fighting the war on women? Let's hurl some acid at those female Democratic senators who won't abide by the mandates they want to impose on the private sector. Now, what's astonishing about that remark is not its cruelty or its misogynistic quality, which it is both of those, of course. Um, hurling acid on women has been recorded in 20 countries. 40% of the attacks have been on women who are under the age of 18. But what's really astonishing, at least to me, about that is how routine that comment is in the overall ebbs and tides of our public discourse. With each passing day, at least it seems, we are treated to fresh examples. With each passing news cycle, we're treated to fresh examples of the misinformation, the character assassination, the incendiary metaphors, the poisonous historical analogies that compose our contemporary public discourse. And this is what's considered normal. We're used to this. We, ex we largely accept this. Uh, toxic public rhetoric is a fact of everyday life. It is a form of entertainment. It is a corporate product that is bought and sold. And so our Contemporary rhetorical landscape features people like Glenn Beck, who once mused on air about uh, beating a public official to death with a shovel. Uh, people like the MSNBC host Ed Schultz, who called a Fox female pundit a right-wing slut. In the political arena, we have people like Alan West, uh, the Republican congressman who uh, has called Democrats uh, Nazi uh, propagandists. We have Maxine, I'm, try, I'm trying to balance, as you can see. We have, we, we have uh, Maxine West, the Democratic Congresswoman, who's called Republican leaders demons. And I haven't even mentioned, well, I have, actually, I have Rush Limbaugh and Sandra Fluke. I could go on, and I'm sure you have your own examples of, of this. So these are lurid, 
And the media is drawn to these, and that's why we hear about them. But what I think of as the crisis of public discourse goes beyond the lurid and the sensational. I, 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 what I would put to you is that we are at a time in our public discourse where we have no shared agreement on the nature of a fact. We have no standards, no shared standards for how to interpret factual information. We have no shared criteria for how to, uh, for our expressive language, how to govern or, or um, how to decide what is appropriate in the use of metaphors or similes or any other kinds of rhetorical um, <clears throat> uh, uh, figures of speech. Nor do we have or do we see uh, very often in public discourse deliberative language that would allow <coughs> the participants to express uncertainty, to admit to doubt, to um, acknowledge that they might in fact be wrong. Instead, what we have is a series of assertions and counter-assertions that are hurled back and forth like rocket shells at one tribe and the other, and that only serve to divide us further, to fill us with fear and distrust, and to make reasonable compromise very, very difficult to obtain. Now, that is what I consider the crisis of public argument. The second question is, hasn't it always been this way? Yes, it has. Um, the, in the 1828 presidential election, for example, Andrew Jackson was accused of being uh, a murderer, a gambler, a uh, of committing treason against the United States, and other things. His, his mother was called a prostitute, and his wife, Rachel, was called a bigamist. Um, so yeah, it's always been around. But is it the same? Not really. I said earlier the bottle has changed a little bit. What I mean by that is that our technological capacities are nowhere, are, are completely different than anything that might have been imagined in Andrew Jackson today, which means that we can hurl these accusations farther and faster and more prolifically and reach more people than ever before, thus increasing their potency. Um, the poison has always been with us. The means for delivering the poisons have changed. The third and final, how much time do I have left, finally? Five minutes, okay. So in five minutes, the question is, can we do anything about this? And the answer that I want to <coughs> offer you is yes, we can. Um, and, and to do that, and, and to explain what I mean by that, I'd like us just to consider very briefly the nature of argument. And, and the way that we can begin to affect or build a better public discourse is to think about the virtues of argument. Argument is a series of claims and, and proofs. And what are we doing when we make a claim? When we make a claim, we are, in a sense, proposing something of ourselves to an audience. For our audience to accept the claim, it, they must be assured that our claims are made without equivocation, without deception. When we make a claim, we are practicing the virtue of honesty. Claims have no rhetorical force or logical force without evidence. What are we doing when we supply evidence to a claim? We are, in a sense, making a statement of our own integrity, that we are willing to be accountable to the things that we are claiming. And we are, in a sense, offering a show of respect to those people who will judge our claims. We are saying that they, we think of them, that they are reasonable and judicious enough to evaluate our claims cogently. So when we provide evidence, we are practicing the virtues of integrity and accountability and respectfulness. Do you have some water? Is this against my time, John? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> most claims and most evidence cannot stand by itself. There is that test where you have to, you have to consider alternative points of view. You have to consider counterclaims, counter evidence. And when we engage other points of view, when we do that seriously and fairly, we are, we are engaging in perhaps the most radical behavior of all. We are exposing ourselves <clears throat> to doubt and the possibility that we may change our mind. We are abandoning the consolations of certainty, and we are embracing the contradictions and uncertainties that adhere to every worthwhile question. So when we practice counter-arguments, we're practicing virtues. We're practicing the virtues of tolerance and generosity 
and intellectual courage. Argument so construed is a way to build a better public discourse. It requires of us that we make ourselves aware of the ethics of argumentation and that we pledge to model and practice that argumentation, whether in the classroom, whether in our dormitories, whether we are given a talk show on Fox News. Any one of those would apply. <clears throat> so to conclude, I said at the beginning that I thought Notre Dame was, in a sense, the ideal place <clears throat> to begin to rebuild a better public discourse. It won't happen. It won't happen with some of our political leaders. It won't happen with television talk show hosts who make tons of money um, you know, peddling the kinds of discourse that we're all become so accustomed to. It has to happen with each of us. And Notre Dame seems to me to be the ideal place. If you think for just a moment about where we are in the world, there are 7 billion people on the planet. Many of those people live in conditions of war and famine and hunger. There are 350 million people in the United States. And many of the people who live in our country, our countrymen and women, do not have access to decent health care, to decent housing, to, to education. And then think of us, this very small but enormously privileged community. Think of the way we live and what we do here. Every day we wake up, our task is to pursue knowledge. Now, when we, when we wake up, wake up, we may first have check Facebook and have some coffee before we pursue, but, but that's what we do. We ask deep questions, and we try to, when we study for the answers. We live a life not all that different from the students in Plato's Academy. We are incredibly privileged. We have opportunities that few people in the world have. So if there is to be a better public discourse, it has to come from people like you, people like us who have these opportunities, who can share them and spread them. And that's why I believe it is possible. The third answer, I hope, is an optimistic one. Yes, it can happen. And I think it should begin, if it hasn't already, at Notre Dame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, two great acts to follow. I also thank the uh, Center for Social Concerns for putting together such a great event. Um, so I indeed, uh, you were a little bit reluctant, but I indeed start with uh, Sandra Fluck. Um, <laughs> who this past spring testified before uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives on the controversial HHS mandate, arguing that her school, uh, Georgetown University, should not be exempt from covering the cost of her contraception through its health care coverage, despite its being a Catholic university. Radio talk show host Rush Limbaugh then called her a slut and a prostitute on the air, as we know. So, but then, uh, to balance things, this past summer, a super PAC working to re-elect President Barack Obama launched a negative ad campaign against his opponent, Mitt Romney that by all accounts was reminiscent of the swift boat tactics used by President George W. Bush against his opponent, John Kerry, in the 2004 uh, presidential campaign. Then Bush launched ads that called into question the Vietnam service record of Kerry, a decorated veteran. Kerry's popularity was hurt so bad by it that he could not recover during the fall and by election day. This past summer, Obama's uh, defenders launched ads questioning Romney's character, calling him an embezzler and a felon, and even holding him responsible for the death of his former employee's wife from cancer, associating it with her uh, lack of health care. The tactic was ironic, given that President Obama had run in 2008 as a unifier, a reconciler, and as one who would bring a positive spirit back to American politics. So this is what we call polarization. Technically, polarization does not mean nastiness. It means that opinions are statistically distributed into clusters or poles, far to the left and to the right, rather than clustering in the center. Several political scientists have confirmed polarization. We political scientists are good at coming up with statistical models for what everybody else already knows. <laughs> uh, but they, are very, they do offer different explanations for it. One school offers a bottom-up theory holding that opinions have shifted over time among the electorate in a polarizing direction. 
Others offer a top-down theory that holds media and political elites responsible for dividing people. One version, for instance, points to changes in the media market. It used to be that three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, competed for the center. Remember that, the older people among us? Thus, we would see kind, grandfatherly news anchors like Walter Cronkite and John Chancellor, who captured the fancies of the middle-of-the-road market. But then, with the rise of cable television, we had many networks, not just three, and they found it advantageous to capture niche markets of like-minded like people on either end of the spectrum. So we get Fox News with Bill O'Reilly and MSNBC with Rachel Maddow. Whatever theory one likes, it is clear that our political discourse has gotten nastier and far more mean-spirited, as Professor Duffy uh, said so well. And so the solution is a return to civility, right? Would you consider it polarizing if you heard the term vicious racist in political discourse? Well, in fact, the term is from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. King, of course, is celebrated as a unifier, a reconciler, and a champion of nonviolent resistance. What's going on here? The phrase from King's speech complexifies the case for civility. When matters of great justice and moral importance are at stake, are we not warranted in using strong language, even strongly critical language? Even Jesus referred to his opponents as a brood of vipers and whitewashed sepulchers. sepulchers. Martin Luther King is the author of one of the most famous pieces of writing in American history, Letter from Birmingham Jail. We easily forget, though, that he was not writing this letter against white racists directly, but rather to other black leaders who were calling him to slow down and to cool the temperature of the civil rights movement. Things were getting too heated, they said. We need to take it gradually. And in a sense, they were calling for civility. In response, King wrote down some of the most famous words in American political history. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the views of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost meant, always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Whatever civility means, it cannot mean putting the brakes on justice. I would also like to raise questions about some other proposals for civility. Some say that the key is to get emotion out of politics. Let us stick with reason. But surely this is neither realistic nor desirable. Emotion can be manipulative, but can also stir our hearts towards the noble. Who would want President Kennedy to have taken the emotion out of his speech at the Berlin Wall in 1963? Or President Reagan to do the same when he told Gorbachev to tear down the same wall in 1987? Others say that the problem arises when religion gets into politics. I once saw a bumper sticker that said, the last time religion mixed with politics, people were burned at the stake. The reference, of course, is to early modern Europe, when people killed one another for practicing the wrong religion in the wrong territory. Much liberal enlightenment thought is premised on the idea that civil politics is secular politics. Religion is inherently divisive, irrational, and violent. In the last 15 years, political philosophers have followed the great political philosopher John Rawls in advancing a case for confining political argument to public reason, which is secular. Making appeals on the basis of religion is destabilizing and divisive, this school thinks. But these arguments prove problematic, in my view. The historical case is highly selective. Religion may have fueled war in early modern Europe, but it also propelled the abolitionist movement, early feminism, early 20th century labor movements, and the civil rights movement. The latter is indeed hard to envision, apart from Martin, Reverend Martin Luther King's sermons. Moreover, secularism can be highly violent as well. Witness regimes in the Soviet Union, Mubarak's Egypt, or Calle's uh, Mexico. Even in our discourse today, nastiness is hardly confined to the religious. Gentle persuasion, fiery exhortation, and cynical manipulation can be found among religious and secular alike. The argument also overlooks that religion might have certain virtues that encourage a more elevated discourse, love of enemies, forgiveness, and the dignity of the person. Many of the things uh, stressed in uh, John the 23rd's uh, Great Encyclical. 
Another proposal is to maintain a healthy sense of doubt and skepticism. And to some extent, this makes sense. Skepticism is in some sense one of the, or at least in a, a kind of holding an open mind in a sense is one of the virtues of inquiry. Blind obedience is never a virtue. But too often the recommendation of doubt is made towards those who hold the positions the recommender does not find persuasive, not to the recommender's own position. The one who cautions doubt about when life begins is rarely doubtful about the evidence for global warning, warming. The one who cautions doubt about the wisdom of government spending is rarely doubtful about the need for a strong national defense. And who of us would recommend a posture of skepticism about whether a minority, say, ought to have equal civil rights? For all of these cautions, though, I still do agree that America is polarized by destructive political speech and that a solution is needed. In my own writings, I have explored and advanced the concept of reconciliation. I have proposed it as a way of thinking about justice in countries dealing with the massive injustices of genocide, war, and dictatorship. Reconciliation is a concept that comes from religious traditions. It poses an alternative way of thinking about justice to the concept that dominates the international community, which is a liberal rights-based concept. In the Catholic tradition, or virtually any Christian understanding, reconciliation is the crucial action that God accomplished for humanity through cross and resurrection, one that restores. It is the action of the Eucharist, which restores to right relationship. This is indeed the crucial notion of reconciliation, restoration to right relationship. And it's a concept also found in, uh, very prominently in Pachamin Terrace and in the prayer that was uh, prayed as we began. It is a concept that can find resonance with those who understand it in secular terms as well. One of the crucial features of reconciliation is that it includes justice in terms of rights and equality. This helps to answer one of the key criticisms often made of reconciliation, which is that it represents an embrace or a compromise without justice. In the uh, a movement to overthrow apartheid in South Africa, reconciliation was a common theme among the black uh, resistance to apartheid, in part because it was so deeply informed by religion. But there was a moment in the late 1980s when a group of black theologians criticized their fellow theologians who were opposing uh, the apartheid government by, for their concept of reconciliation. It was too stressful of, um, you know, forgiveness and, um, you know, loving the enemy and so forth and not urgent enough about overthrowing the apartheid government. The, however, these theologians who authored what is known as the Kairos document arguing this, they themselves didn't want to throw out the idea of reconciliation. They thought it just had to be, the, the justice dimension had to be stressed much more strongly. But if reconciliation includes the justice of rights and equality and the rule of law and so forth, it also includes much more. After the fight for apartheid was over, the new majority black government turned to the defeated apartheid leaders and sought to include them in the new community. A major theme was forgiveness, practiced most for prominently by Nelson Mandela. You may have remembered, if you've seen the movie Invictus, you saw that uh, portrayed. Mandela was famous for forgiving his white jailers and inviting them to his inauguration. <coughs> Even um, Betsy uh, Fervor, the um, wife of the um, original prime minister who was the architect of apartheid, um, Nelson Mandela invited her to the inauguration and she said, uh, she declined and kind of politely said, well, come by my house for tea sometime. Well, he decided to take her up on it. Uh, she lived hundreds of miles away from the capital, but he got his helicopters to fly him out there, and he actually showed up at her front door and said, I'm here for tea. Um, <laughs> and probably most dramatically, um, uh, in the sport of rugby, the South African rugby team, which had been banned from international competition during apartheid, emerged uh, in the new South Africa and um, was fighting for, uh, for, for the world championship in, um, in, in, it was being played in South Africa, the Springboks. Now the symbolism here is great because rugby had been uh, known as the white, white man's sport and kind of a symbol of apartheid. And so it wasn't clear whether a cha South African championship team was going to be well received at all, whether this would be a unifying notion. President Mandela showed up at the stadium and donned the uh, um, jersey of the, of the Springboks and, and ran around the stadium holding a South African flag. 
It was a very strong piece of symbolism that said we're all one nation uh, now. He offered an apology for, uh, also offered his own apology for crimes that the African National Congress had committed during the struggle. Through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the new government sought to extend recognition to um, uh, blacks who had suffered under apartheid and also ignited a healthy uh, national conversation about the past. In the process, some of the most hardened perpetrators of apartheid repented and uh, changed their hearts. True, it's true, of course, that this reconciliation process was not without its problems. Many criticized it for a lack of prosecution, a lack of reparations, and so forth. But one need only contrast it with the way that political transitions often take place around the world where the victors rule with an iron fist and the defeated are shot or tortured. Herein lies what reconciliation has to say about waging contestation in politics. Reconciliation includes the justice of rights, equality, and the rule of law, yes. But it also includes an aspiration of a unified community and an effort to heal the wounds that justice has left, that injustices have, le have left. Restoration of right relationship. This is the kind of struggle that King exemplified. On the one hand, as we saw in the letter from Birmingham jail, he would not compromise or trim back his demands. But on the other, he pursued these demands in a way that invited his <coughs> opponent to join a new community based on equality. He called it the beloved community. His method for doing this was nonviolent action based on love for enemies. He essentially said to his enemies, I oppose the system that you are defending with everything I have, but I also believe that you can be better than you are and invite you to a different kind of country. Opposition and invitation went hand in hand. So did justice and forgiveness. <coughs> Among other things, this kind of action took the virtue of discipline. Both the values and its resolve had to be inculcated in its foot, sol foot soldiers. And one of the results of this method was that many Americans came to <coughs> change their views on race and did so in a way that they would not have had King pursued either violence or even the rhetoric of Limbaugh, Maddo, or the Swift Boat negative advertising. So what does this mean for our political discourse today? It does not mean evading the struggle for justice, limiting ourselves to secular discourse, or adopting, adopting a thoroughgoing skepticism towards our positions. It means rather pursuing our positions of justice with a more expansive goal of achieving not only this justice, but a broader restoration of right relationship. It means inviting our opponent into a more just community and treating him as one who might potentially be a member of it. It means carrying on the struggle in the meantime in a way that respects the dignity of the opponent, offers him reasons, and seeks to find out what is right about his own position, doing so, or her position, doing so in a way that perhaps amounts to a fuller synthesis of justice. It means being willing to forgive and to take responsibility for one's own wrongs. None of this is meant to deny the difficulty or the messiness of the struggle. Justice in the temporal perspective will be partially achieved and often radically unfulfilled in our lifetimes. But as is illustrated most sharply in the case of the martyrs, Dr. King being among them, pursuing a cause in this manner of reconciliation also does much to hasten the achievement. So thank you. our panelists for three stimulating presentations. I think we go to question and answer now, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe, we, well, why don't we start then by saying, do you have any particular responses you'd like to make? <laughs> I think we're very polarized. <laughs> Let's see if they come out organically in the question and answer. Yes, say your name. Uh, my name is Daniel. And, um, Are you a Nordic student? Huh? You're a Nordic student? Yes, I am. Okay. Senior. Um, my question would be that um, in terms of reconciliation theory and also just theories of justice, um, I think that if you were to ask representatives from each of the major political parties, they'd say that that's what they're already trying to do um, and that their, their goals are all for reconciliation, all for justice. All that's left is for the other side to kind of open their arms as well. So just how, how do these, what would be a response, I guess, to, um, to people that say they're already trying to achieve these goals of reconciliation? 
I mean, in, in my view, I think you know the kinds of examples that um, I mean, the kinds of examples that Professor Duffy gave of the way politics is uh, carried out, I, I don't think involves what I would call the invitation to a better community. So people are um, people are using the kind of language and the kind of um, uh, you know, rhetoric and so forth that, that seems to kind of either shut the other out or there, there's no room for the other to kind of come on board something in common. Um, so as opposed to a, um, a kind of uh, strategy where one might identify common values and say, in light of those common values, I'd like to see, say, have you see this, that this, that this is the way we got to pursue it. Um, it seems to be something quite the opposite where there's sort of no room for us together in the end. I think that's, you know, that's the kind of uh, language and rhetoric, rhetoric we're seeing. And so, um, so one thing I think is changing the uh, mode, of, mode of discourse. So, um, I mean, I gave the example of Dr. King's phrase, vicious racist, from his speech to kind of provoke. But by and large, I think he, want, he was opposing his opponents in a way that also tried to say, hey, I think you're someone who could eventually come on board, and, you know, in the distant future maybe, but, but uh, historically I think that happened in many cases. I also would add to that um, that we don't really have meaningful public spaces for discourse about what constitutes justice in, in particular cases, what constitutes the right and the good. Uh, so in the examples given, a lot of these exchanges are through many different media. Um, and what would happen if we could create more public spaces where there were ground rules for respectful discourse and where we could actually have a meaningful conversation about what is just, what is right, what is good. Um, I don't know if you've had any experiences of such a public space. I think they're hard to come by. Um, I get, well, in response to that, I think a lot of people would say that um, if you're going to have campaign spokesper spokespeople on a, uh, on a news station, you're going to have both the uh, the RNC communication director and you're going to have the DNC communication director. Um, they're going to ask both people tough questions um, and see have, have you have Fox News saying fair and balanced, and you have MSNBC saying lean forward, and they all want to. And you have both campaigns saying also that they very much want to unify the country and that they're very willing to compromise and that they they want America to be a very united community. Um, so, in a way, there's very divisive language. There's the racist, the vicious racist comments. But if people that Dr. King were calling vicious racists could eventually come to the other side, um, you could say the same for arguments that Democrats or Republicans are making about the other side too. Sure, someone's a right-wing slut, but they can eventually become a left-wing um, chase person. Um, <laughs> It, it, just seems, it, it there just seems to be a continuity where I guess the point that's being established is that there's a discontinuity. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I, I think you raised an excellent <coughs> point. I would say that to start with the Republican RNC, the RNC spokesperson and the Democratic spokesperson, is, that's the wrong place to start. What I was trying to communicate earlier about sort of virtues of discourse and virtuous discourses, I think have to start in other settings, what, what Professor File called community spaces, public spaces. I think that our politics are so deeply compromised uh, that this will not be possible un until there is a popular movement for a better kind of language. And until we practice that language and model that language and insist on that language and that type of discourse, we won't get it from the people who currently have these positions. I, I think the, the idea of a public space is a very important one. One of the things you often hear is we, we shouldn't talk about, we shouldn't argue about politics or religion. Well, why not? Those are fundamental to the way we live. The problem is we don't know how to argue about those things. We, we, we really don't have a method. And, and so I think we have to develop methods in a sense that are much more closer to our community lives 
and <coughs> the media, the, the discourses of media at present, I think, are too far gone. It's like James Joyce, when he was a penniless writer, supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly he had this meeting with Yeats, who was by then a world-famous poet. And, he, and Joyce, upon meeting him, said to Yeats, the penniless writer said to the famous poet, it's too late for me to help you. <laughs> I think we're in the same situation with, our, with the Richard Murdochs and the others in our politics who, who, who do not recognize uh, virtue in, in, in discourse. Thank you. Yep. Jane, you uh, I just enjoyed very much hearing your reflections. And in view of the, uh, the lack of uh, meaningful public spaces and the desire to uh, restore right relationships, do you think the various uh, Occupy movements are a step in that direction? Obviously, they're very amorphous and they're spread out. But uh, otherwise, we're in somewhat uh, despair looking for a place, because as John says, we, we try to have meaningful dialogue here, but you know, try to have the same thing outside or with the blaring 24-7 media. So in looking for little places that might be starting here, in your opinion, do you think that that has a germ of what you're after? We're after. <laughs> It captures my imagination to think about the Occupy movement as one example. I would want, though, uh, for there to be dialogue between the folks who have occupied and the places where the that are inhabited by their by their adversaries or um, would be interlocutors. I um, I think a lot of the exchanges that happened occurred through the media rather than directly. Um, and could there be, uh, thinking about Martin Luther King's witness again, since that has come up, could there be uh, a space that could be held in common um, among disparate interlocutors? So Wall Street bankers together with people camped out in front of the, the exchange, the Wall Street exchange so that there could be some ground rules for discourse that would guide a conversation in order to get at the deeper values at stake uh, economically, for example, in our society. Um, I'm not so sure that in its, in its most organic form, the Occupy movements around the country really served as welcoming spaces for adversaries um, to enter into discourse with ground rules of respect. I do have res I, I, I do think that many of the instantiations of that movement worked hard to create ground rules of community in their in their particular settings. But more of that work would have to be done across the lines of this room. That's a great answer. <laughs> Wait, you just come over here to get eye contact with Sorry. Sure. conversations. Um, Thanks. And, and your name is? I'm Molly Gower. I'm a visiting assistant professor at St. Mary's. Um, and I, I sort of um, appreciate all of your thoughtful words about the importance of cultivating discursive communities. Um, and communities that talk about what matters most. I was intrigued, though, by Professor Duffy's point about having, I mean, by first of all meeting some sort of mode of coming to consensus about what counts as fact. And I, I really sort of stuck there, seeing discursive communities um, as we can help them to grow, as places where, of course, I think I have your scheme, right, where interpret work that are, that do the job of interpretation and help us to cultivate appropriate forms of expressive language, but it really seems like the basic crisis is we can't agree on what counts as fact, you know, and sort of how do we, is it discursive communities that help us to, or is it education, and sort of thinking about a 
epistemology sooner? I don't know. I just wonder how do we how do we come together to figure out what needs reconciled, <coughs> who's and who's, who, who should who on whom it is to apologize. Well, I think you very neatly articulated the crisis <laughs> in, in much shorter time than I did. Um, that, uh, that we cannot agree on the nature of factual data is emblematic of the problem that we have. Um, the question is how to resolve that, if that's the question. Yes, yeah, sorry, there was meant to be a question mark at the end. Well, I was once, uh, I was once, uh, moaning to my spouse that I didn't know if this was possible to resolve or not, and she said, well, you wouldn't be in education if you really believed that. <laughs> so I do think that education is where we begin. Uh, and I, as I said earlier, I think that we, we need to look very hard at the way that we understand our, our communicative practices. <clears throat> because until we're able to resolve that, until we're able to develop ways of disagreeing with one another that, as President Clinton said the other night, that don't lead us to blood sport. Um, we're, not going to, we're not going to make much progress on any of these things. But in a sense, this is a very deeper existential crisis that we have, that we cannot agree on the nature of factual data. And I don't know that there's any easy resolution to this. I think it's just something that we have to work at. But I would offer the analogy of a doctor. Um, doctors. The, the ultimate fate of every patient that every doctor works on is the same. The patient dies. Right? In the end, no matter what the, pa the patient does, the doctor does, the patient dies. But the doctor doesn't, at that, you know, with that knowledge, doesn't conclude that there's no point in doing any of this. If you go in for a flu shot, the doctor doesn't say, what's the point? You're just going to die anyway. <laughs> I mean, you work on the quality of life while you can. And I think that's where, that's our task in, at, at places like Notre Dame, to work on the quality of the discourse, to work on the quality of our communications, to work out these standards as perfectly as we possibly, as perfectly as we can, given the existential crisis that we've been issued. I mean, if you read Alistair McIntyre's book, he'll tell you this goes back to the 17th century. So it's not a new problem. Um, and so we do what we can in the space that we have. I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes the problem is starting with, I mean, the different parties don't even agree upon what the, what the issues are, or what the reality is, um, and what facts are. I mean, and, um, you know, Turkey has a law that you can't speak about the Armenian genocide. France has a law that if you did not, you can't deny it. And so, you know, where do we, uh, where do we begin? Um, it, when I, I spent uh, uh, several years traveling regularly working in the region of Kashmir, where there's been very uh, intense bloody warfare between, um, you know, well, in part Hindus and Muslims, but it's more than that, people who are for and against the secession of Kashmir and so forth. But, um, so we often have people in the same room who uh, are associated with one or the other side and have all the emotions and the, and, and the different, very different interpretations of what the conflict is about than, um, than, than, than each other. But one of the things we try to do is just to get the parties to a table where they can first just practice the act of listening to um, one another. And so we try to establish uh, ground rules where you have to allow the other person to speak for a certain amount of time. You can't interrupt, you can't correct, you can't jump in. And, and then you have to actually try to summarize what that person said without, um, without giving your own interpretation. But you, you wouldn't realize, believe how enormously difficult just doing that is for people. And, um, but also that when they do do it, um, it actually is kind of a, a breakthrough. It opens up a kind of space for more conversation that leads to a better kind of uh, trajectory. So, um, but often just um, you know, on the most basic level, like you say, when they can't even agree upon what the conflict is about, what the facts are, just trying to get to a space where an actual reasoned conversation can occur, or where even listening can actually occur. And uh, Pope John Paul II is encyclical, Ut Unum Senta, said it was about dialogue, but he said listening is an act of love. And I think that there's something about that, just to accomplish that act alone can be a, a huge first step.
uh, Chris Smith, sociology. So I wonder if it's a if it's too superficial to say that it's about disagreement about facts, and if the more profound way to put it, and I'm focused on the U.S. context now, um, is just a fundamental loss of faith that a reality, a shared reality exists that we can make truth claims about, that we can all work toward, and. Um, so, the, so Professor Duffy, the, the presupposition of where you want to go, which I'm totally on board with you, is that everyone wants to know what the truth is. But my experience and observation, especially of late in a lot of controversies, is people don't care about truth. They, don't, they think truth itself is an oppressive idea. And then all that's left is will to power. It's just, I want to win. And then rhetoric just becomes an instrumental tool to, to destroy the enemy. And and then to connect that to your last comment about it needs to begin in education. If this is correct, American higher education and European has been at the forefront through so radical social constructivism, various postmodern theories of reality, et cetera, so I won't go on, but we're the, we're the ones in higher education who've been promoting the destruction of faith in truth in a shared reality. So how, how, maybe not Notre Dame, I mean the whole sector, <laughs> but how is, how is higher education, say, going to take the lead when you have religious studies departments dissolving their whole subject and saying, well, religion is just this sort of made up thing. I mean, it, it seems to me that higher education is, is deeply part of the problem, not part of the solution. And therefore, how might Notre Dame be different in that regard? sitting here thinking about Marge's comment that, you know, the classroom is that shared public space. <laughs> you just totally blown that out of the water. <laughs> no, I, I think, I, I think you're, you're articulating the problem that we face. Um, you know, I, 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 re I referenced to Professor McIntyre's book earlier, where he makes a very compelling case that, you know, the uh, Enlightenment took away our teleological systems and our, our shared believe to, toward truth and left us with really not much that we could, uh, we could collectively agree upon. So I think this is the problem. I think this is the crisis. And I think that what you said about, about uh, postmodernism and, um, and social constructivist thought is exactly right. Uh, it, it's, it's served, in a sense, to, to fragment great concepts of truth and humanism even further than they might have been. Uh, the reconstruction of that, the, the, the move away from rhetoric as a will to power, I don't think these are anything that have very simple answers. The, the answer that I've offered tonight in a very abbreviated form was to look back uh, at Aristotle's conception of virtue and to think of, to, to try to find some shared common virtues that we might practice together. And by agreeing upon those virtues, whether they be honesty or accountability or intellectual courage, uh, that that might be a way to begin. And I, I, I think, as I say this, I realize it's a very, it's a very, in some ways, dissatisfying response. But it's the only response that, that I, you know, that there aren't a lot of responses available. To us. I, I totally agree with you about that. But I mean, Aristotle was extinguished in the, you know, the 17th century out of science. And if you try to say, well, it's sort of human teleological you'll just be laughed out of the academy in most places. I mean, McIntyre, of course, has opened up a crack in the door, but... Right. Well, I would say this, and I don't mean to dominate, I'm sorry. Um, one of the concepts in rhetoric that I think is a useful concept to recall is the notion of kairos and the kairotic moment, the moment in which certain forms of rhetorical practice have purchase. And I think we are at a, a kairotic moment in our country you referenced that we're in the United the US context, you're talking about the US context. I think we're in a chirotic moment in this country where there is a, a, a realization on the part of a great many people that our present rhetorical practices are wholly inadequate to the kinds of politics that we generally think are a good thing. And maybe that's the crack that we can work with, that there is this possibility for a reconception of the way that we practice rhetoric with one another. I would just add, I think our theology department is alive and well. <laughs> uh, I say
say that just about every class I teach, I, and students haven't left me out of the classroom yet, ju just that there is a telos here, and theologically, in Pachamantaris, the telos is the reign of God. And do we believe that? If we're a Catholic university, can we say that without feeling sheepish or ashamed? And can we create places of public discourse where there is this thick account of virtue and there is a thick account of the good? And this is, I, I don't know if you want to say more about why Notre Dame is an ideal place for what you have in mind, but when I heard you say that, that's what I was inferring. Well, I, I agree. and. and and, 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 and I have reservations about our religious character being the basis for this transformation because part of the problem is, is that we can develop or we can articulate the virtues that are common to Notre Dame and that are inherent or the Catholic, inherent in the Catholic faith and Catholic practice, but can, how do we bring those virtues out to other faith communities? Um, how do we bring those virtues out to communities that are not grounded in, in that type of faith? And I think that's just another layer, of, uh, another complication that we have to address. <clears throat> Part of the problem is, you know, <clears throat> communities of faith can articulate the virtues that guide their practice, their belief, um, much, in some ways, I think, much more easily than communities that, that without faith. But the question and the challenge becomes, how do we talk to one another if we have different systems of virtue, different criteria for virtue? Yeah, and I think about John the 23rd talking indirectly, at least, to Christian, and making and taking great care in this document, in paragraphs 168 to 160, of distinguishing what might be considered false philosophical premises from the movements that result, and the person who errs from the error so there's a way in which there can be a disagreement, a fundamental disagreement about truth, and yet the discourse is guided by this basic bedrock belief in the dignity of the person, of the interlocutor. And so if, as a Catholic university, Notre Dame is able to articulate from a more specifically Catholic and Christian vision uh, what the good is, that's already uh, a groundwork out of which it's possible to enter into the discourse with people of other faith traditions or, or no faith. There's also, a, I mean, one source of hope is the, the kind of reigning um, conception you talk about postmodernism and or, or a thoroughgoing naturalism, which you know, says we can only know empirical facts and so forth. Um, I mean, one of the problems with them is they're, they're self-undermining, and it's hard to hold them without eventually kind of hoisting yourself by your own petard. You know, what makes the analysts think that they are different from being constructed by power or what, what, what have you? I mean, I think that um, I think there's some, you know, overthinking that those kinds of, um, you know, paranoid commitments will eventually kind of run out of steam. Um, but also, I think, I mean, getting back to on the more positive side, as, as a Catholic university, how do we engage? Um, I mean, I think that, it, you know, in addition to our kind of, you know, full-blown theological conception and so forth, there's also kind of a tradition of engagement um, that, that is grounded in the kind of commitments to reason and truth, but also can in, in, engage others. That um, There's Benedict XVI in his... Um, uh, uh, forum, the court, the court of the Gentiles. So this goes all the way back to, you know, Apostle Paul on Mars Hill in Athens, where there's a kind of um, tradition of engagement. So, so you say you're postmodern. Well, how do you answer, you know, in, in a kind of um, engagement where if we, you know, if we believe in truth, uh, we, you know, we can begin by kind of interrogating one another, but in a way that, um, you know, possibly could open up, open up space. I mean, I think that there's. Um, you know, at least some grounds for maybe <laughs> if uh, one wants to find some optimism. So we have about 10 minutes left, and I've seen, I've seen three or four hands. I'm going to go with the students first, uh, but then I'm going to ask them to be quite succinct in their questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm uh, studying political science and theology. It seems to me that Catholicism in particular actually is polarized. Um, maybe that's perfectly demonstrating the fact that we have vice presidential candidates in both parties who identify as Catholic. <coughs> But there are people on either side of the political aisle who seem almost ready to excommunicate the other side's candidate. So how do we get past that? 
I mean, how do, how can we preach to the wider country if we can't even see each other as good Catholics with different opinions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, someone was talking about the election recently. If you take it on its face, if you just look at the platforms, uh, neither party, neither party's platform really represents the fullness of Catholic teaching. And uh, I think the candidates, much like each of us, uh, who call ourselves Catholic, represent a certain point of view. Um, but probably, at the end of the day, we, we would gain by a conversation with one another about what, what do we hold? What are our beliefs? And how do those relate? How do we move from principle to application? I would love to have that conversation with Paul Ryan, for example, about his budget. <laughs> Uh, you know, invite him to the Catholic Worker House for a day. <laughs> it would be great if he could come. What a conversation that would be. And I have a feeling I would see a different side of Paul Ryan in that context. I would see a different quality of his Catholicism. And there'd be an opportunity to say, well, okay, Catholic social teaching, preferential option for the poor. And John the 23rd is talking about the Church of the Poor. Would you? Where do, where do you stand on that? Um, what, what is your position? I haven't uh, heard uh, an interview with him where he has so directly engaged with someone who could actually raise deeper theological questions. So I don't know. I don't know what his view might be. Uh, but that would be the sort of conversation I would love to have if there were an opportunity. And to do that, in a public space in a respectful way, where uh, our main goal is not to look for a soundbite, but to really get at what what the preferential option for the poor means as part of the fund. I get to hear that conversation happen with the candidates. Uh, my name is Ben. I actually work for the Alumni Association. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, an, an interesting point that you just made in regards to uh, Paul Ryan is I sometimes feel like you made a point based off of your personal narrative and how his, his position should fit into your personal narrative when somebody if we're talking about bringing context and truth, Joe Biden has not given much donation-wise, and as a Catholic, he's not even questioned. Whereas Paul Ryan may give thousands and thousands of dollars, and yet because his budget doesn't fit technically, I'm not necessarily saying your personal narrative, but a situational narrative like that, he's judged for that. And I sometimes feel like we create our sacred canopies out of our narratives. And if a certain political doctrine doesn't necessarily fit your personal viewpoint in your narrative, we completely dismiss one from the other. When really, if Paul Ryan were to come to a soup kitchen, do you think that he'd sit there and spit on the pork? Probably not. You know, But yet, because his political viewpoint doesn't fit yours, it somehow doesn't create a context for truth to exist. So I I'm think gonna play, I'll push you toward a question. Yeah. So I think I think I think that I'm wondering one, how do you remove your personal narrative so that you can come to a point of just saying this is where I stand, where do you stand, and how can we join together in that? Well, I would say I'd love to invite Joe Biden, too. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, if, if we could have a conversation in Paul Ryan's uh, hometown or Joe Biden's hometown, that would be fine, too, as long as people who are on the margins could be present as well, as long as people whose voices are not heard could be present. Um, and I, I certainly didn't think that Paul Ryan would, as you said, spit on the board, but 
I, I, I think there's some caricaturization happening there, but um, it's, and I should tell you, I, I, I'm, I don't agree with either party, so it's not, <laughs> it's not where I'm coming from as a Catholic worker. Anyway, uh, I take your point, and yet, how do we engage in discourse if we check our, our own departure point? Uh, we're doing away with epistemology, and I don't think that's possible. I mean, we can't have rational discourse because we, we have a departure point. The question is whether or not we're naming it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually more honest for me to say, <coughs> Paul Ryan, Joe Biden, I live in a Catholic worker community. Um, what we're trying to do is practice Matthew 25. If you're Catholics, <coughs> what do you think about Matthew 25? So I'm doing what you're suggesting, but I, I can't check my departure point at the door, pretend that I don't have one, um, or to seek some sterile room for discourse where neither of us has a departure point. That, that sounds kind of unnerving, really. Um, because what ground, then, would we have for seeking truth? John, oh, John O'Callaghan, uh, the Department of Philosophy. This would be a question for Professor File and Professor Philpott. Both of you seem to rely upon, at least tacitly, a fairly thick concept or thick notion of the common good. Um, certainly, John the Twenty-Third, I think, does both in Pachamantiris and in Mater et Magistra. Um, but one of the difficulties with regard to the church, but also in political philosophy as well, is um, the notion of th or the idea of thick notions of the common good being threatening. Um, you see in Gaudium et Spes, for instance, a kind of instrumentalizing of the notion of the common good, I think out of a fear of 20th century totalitarianism, where the common good thickly understood was sort of, you know, nationalism of some sort or another. And so you get an idea of the common good being the conditions necessary for social groups and individuals to pursue their own fulfillment, I think is the way it puts it. So the common good looks like an instrument for promoting more and more privatized goods. And so I guess the question would be, if we need a thicker notion of the common good that would make sense out of forgiving others for the sake of the common good, reconciling others with others for the sake of the common good, what the thickness of that would look like if it's not going to become a kind of, yet again, another nationalism or whatever, whatever you want to put in that place. I think we're back to teleology. The, the thickest version is the reign of God. The ultimate telos is life. Yeah, but I think lots of people might worry about that as a common good for political society. Well, and then it, virtue ethics helps to shape this argument. So where do we find ourselves in relation to that telos? How do we move personally and communally toward that end, striving, you know, taking uh, John's analogy of the doctor's office? striving to say we can't throw up our hands in hopelessness in the face of uh, what appears to be uh, irreconcilable differences in public discourse. We, we have to continue to strive. And there are approximate ends along the way toward achieving the end of the good. And that will involve continually asking what the good is and not giving up on finding public spaces and including all of those whose voices need to be heard uh, who are called to participate in shaping the good, which is every member of society, not giving up on that project as part of realizing the good. And also part of the genius of Catholic thought is there's a strong emphasis upon the common, but there's also the, the emphasis upon the dignity of the individual calls for certain things that have to be safeguards in the law, like human rights. I think the big stress in the contemporary church on human rights and, uh, and certainly, you know, put sharp limits on what governments uh, can, can do as well. Finally, I think uh, John Paul II talked about the balance between civil society, economy, and the state. That if all these things have like a proper role, then the state is also going to have have some real limits. So maybe those things can also answer the uh, danger of uh, totalitarianism. Well, thank you all very much, and thanks to everybody who came tonight. Um, certainly, the crowd here and your own energetic engagement in conversation with these, our panelists, signifies a commitment that we'd like to spread. 
to the kinds of discursive practices that lead to greater <coughs> virtue on this campus, in our church, and in the world. Um, I'd like to offer each of the four of you a t-shirt <laughs> that says Pachem and Terrace on it, the t-shirt of the center, um, this year, uh, to mark our theme. Dean McGreevy, I think it would be really good in your suit. <laughs> um, just a quick highlight, or a kind of an announcement. A week from tonight, we will be able to pursue this kind of an issue with another speaker in another venue. Sister Joan Chittister, OSB, a Dominic, or a Benedictine sister from Erie, Pennsylvania, will be speaking in the library auditorium. A large crowd will be present for that event. The title of her talk is An Uncommon Search for the Common Good. She will be addressing issues arising from Pachim and Terrace from her perspective as a longtime active Catholic, committed layperson and sister, a religious member of religious society, religious community, and an intellectual who's commented on lots of different things. She's been in Notre Dame a number of times. When I was a seminarian, she was on sabbatical here, and I got to know her. She's a great speaker. Um, this is the beginning of a long season in which we hope to begin to establish new methods of relationship and interaction and conversation among ourselves and in our communities. And I really want to thank Rosie McDowell and the Justice Heads Committee, but especially Rosie for putting together this great presentation. Thank you very much, Rosie. The Center will host other events during the year besides next week's events, uh, culminating in a conference in March 2013 called Pachamenteras Raising Voices, which will bring internationally religiously motivated peacemakers and peacekeepers together for a couple day discussion here. Also, um, John Duffy referred to virtuous discourse. He has authored a pledge for, per, for virtuous discourse that we are going to be inviting the Notre Dame community to take, perhaps not in some formal way. Copies of that pledge on a card for easy transport and easy kind of showing in your neighbor's face if she or he is too late to it, um, are available at the door. Um, this can be of use in our lives. Students who live in dorms know that not all conversations are amicable um, or peaceful. And it's not just because you argue over who killed who in Halo 3. Um, it can take, those conversations can be heated. So rules for them are also appropriate, the kinds of rules that call us toward a more virtuous life. Um, finally, it's my pleasure to ask you to join me in thanking our speakers, Dean McGreevy, Professor File, Professor Duffy, and Professor Fletcher.